Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Uh, I hope you escaped on time yesterday from the parties, as we did, in order to be here. So, I'm Hendrik. I'm co-founder and partner of Early Bird, a pan-European early-stage venture investor. Um, we are managing, actually, a family of funds working with the most ambitious and uh, foresighting um, entrepreneurs across Europe. Uh, I'm here today with two of our um, great founders and CEOs of our Digital West portfolio, Oscar and Christina. Um, the introduction has been made and uh, we are supposed to talk about product-led growth. So uh, let me start with the first question. What does it mean, product-led growth, to you? So for me, product-led growth ultimately means that you radically focus on solving a problem. And this can be a problem for your end consumer, and this can be a problem um, yeah, on the business side that you want to, for example, improve a process, make things more efficient, and um, yeah, radically put your customer in the, in, the, in, the, in the middle and actually focus on really solving a problem for your customer. Yeah, I tend to agree with, with you know, everything you said there. For like, the way I look at product like growth is, is like, it's really simple. It's like you know, building something that the customers, the users really, really want and listening to you know, what, are, what, what else do they want, what kind of problems they have and solving those for them, making it really easy for them to extend their use of the product and you know, essentially buy more of the product from you. I mean, since you're both standing for companies, which I think are very good examples for companies uh, which growth is driven by products, how did um, the thought of product-led growth um, influence uh, the management and the development of your companies? How did, make it, did it make a difference? Were there any options back then where you could have chosen a different path, not um, led by product, but by customers, whatever? Um, I think the biggest difference is how you make decisions as a company and how you prioritize. So what has changed a lot from us that like from if you're an early startup from going from a crazy, a crazy feature brainstorming more towards yeah, more strategic approach, how you make decisions and how you create value streams. Because um, I think in the end, your customers, they come to you because they want to have a problem solved. Um, they want to use your product to get a job done, so to say. They're not coming because you're optimizing your sign-up funnel to a T, for example, or um, because you think this technology is very exciting and you built for the sake of technology. I think your customers come because you have a great product. They will forgive you the, some, some flaws in the sign-up funnel ultimately. And that's why I think you need to radically focus on how to create value for your customer and then everything else is a, is a prior tool. I think that's decision-making for us. So when I look at Ivan and, and you know, what we've been doing, doing over the years, so I started working on Ivan some six years ago. I'm a developer by background. I, you know, I love to build all sorts of complex applications. Sometimes, you know, maybe over-engineering things a little bit. <laughs> but, you know, the, at the end of the day, you know, all of these applications use data and they want to store data and process data. And I was wondering, like, why do we all have to spend so much time managing the data infrastructure, figuring out how do backups work? How, how can I scale the, you know, backends when I have more customers coming on board? Rather than, you know, fix these things one by one for, you know, each, each you know, customer, each employer, whatever, we wanted to build a product with Ivan, something that we would have loved to use as developers ourselves. So something by developers, for developers, helping them achieve more, helping them you know, have a you know, better time, you know, focus on, on building what matters. And in you know, early days with Ivan, like, we didn't spend a lot of time thinking of like, what are the alternatives. We thought you know, there's other developers out there that are having similar problems and we can help them you know, you know, uh, you know, make better, make make faster progress, and, and just focus on, on their their uh, you know, applications and building what matters, and that's really worked for us over the years. So focusing on the core audience. I think it's um, ultimately also about creating empathy for your customer and really go deep and try to understand their problems. Because if you speak to a customer, we run a lot of user interviews, normally they give you a problem that they have. But the problem is that people are in general not so self-reflected, so you actually have to get a little bit deeper and usually ask them five times why to get to the actual problem. And I think um, doing this work to get really, really deep, understand the mental blockers of users, like where are the, where are the moments that they drop out, what are their fears? I think really getting to this point to understand your user better than they understand themselves helps you to create better products and solutions and ultimately solve the problems in a better way through new technologies. 
Interesting. Um, how does that influence the organization you're leading? Is it so that at the end of the day, um, yeah, the product guys are uh, setting the stage and um, sales is basically and marketing is following? Um, so this is at least how I understand you. So you assuming once you have the right product, um, um, they, it's going to sell somehow. Is that, is that what you're doing? So I think for us, what changed radically is how we set up teams and what we expect from teams, right? I think building a product 10 years ago, um, your product manager was basically a technical product manager telling the dev team what to do. And this has changed fundamentally in the past years. So I think if I would go to a developer today, I expect them to, to, to be able to tell me what am I working on and how does this basically solve a larger customer problem. And I think once you get your company to that stage that literally every single person in the organization understands why are we doing things, like what is the better future we want to create, um, what is the customer problems, what are the customer voices, then I, I believe everyone can bring in their best because a deaf person, they're really good in technology, right? They can come up with a better solution but they need to understand the problem first. And it's not just the product and the designers. Um, it's pretty much everyone, uh, even the marketing people. If they understand these needs better, they can actually approach our customers in a way better way. Do you agree, Oscar? Yeah, I think there's definitely, like, you can think of the different roles that you have in the company. And sometimes, you know, it's one person having many of those roles, especially early days. But, you know, the point with, you know, product like growth is, like, you have to have all of your team focused on the customers and taking them on the journey with you. So when we started building Ivan, like, you know, it was a team of four, four developers you know, initially. Then we added more, more people over the years, and you know, now we are 300. But you know, what stayed true from the beginning was like everybody has visibility into what the customers are actually doing. Everybody can talk to the customers, get to understand what matters to them. And you know, what, something you said there, sometimes you know, listening to like, what exactly the customers want may not be the, you know, the best thing you can build for them, but it's, it's more about like, what's the problem that they're facing, what's the next problem that they will be facing, and how can we fix something, or how can we build something in our product that makes their lives easier, and you know, everybody else's as well. Yep. Like when we're sc building scalable companies based on products, we cannot be customizing everything for every cu you know, customer one by one. We have to build something that's applicable for, for many more use cases. And there definitely are roles for you know, you know, sales, marketing, engineering, and especially for product management, for kind of distilling all this, you know, this input and figuring out like, what is it that we should be building, how is it, should it be packaged so it's really universally applicable. What we also did is that we structured the entire organization to actually drive growth. Because in the end, if you think about growth, now we talk about growing your customer base, you could either get new users in, you can make sure you retain your current customers, and you make sure to not lose a lot of customers, right? Because all of these three buckets together basically drive growth. And this is how we organize, in general, our company, that there is a part in the company that makes sure we get new users in, they get onboarded, they can try out the product without investing too much into it. So that's one part of the organization. Then we have the middle part, which is basically making sure that our customers are coming back more often, that the product is great, that we build in kind of loops. So we give people reasons to constantly check their app and come back. But then there's also part of the organization that makes sure we're not losing people. And uh, that's important that you have great customer service, but also that you um, allow your customers to, to serve themselves through self-service, for example, to offer um, a lot of things that they can help themselves and don't have to reach out and don't get frustrated. I mean, you both carry a product background. Yeah? Um, Oscar, um, you've been a developer for quite some time. And uh, Christina, you've led the product design in uh, N26 and Zalando. So, um, is it by chance um, and, a, and, a, yeah, and a coincidence um, that you both now lead companies based on product and um, is a core of your growth strategies? Or is it necessary that um, CEOs and leadership teams do have a certain product background in order to be able to what you are doing? So I think something you said, said you know, previously around like having empathy for the, what you know, the customers want, like really being, you know, like understanding the problems they're solving, like tr looking to get solved, and you know how you can relate to them. I think this is something that you know product people may find more natural. Like you could you know be customer of your own product. I think that's key for understanding really like why we are doing all of these things for you know the customers. Uh, 
sure, there could be other backgrounds, and there are definitely you know a bunch of you know diverse backgrounds in all of these companies, and that's I think necessary to you know be able to serve also different audiences. Yeah, I think for me it's even more interesting because I'm right now being the CEO and the CPO still, and. Um, I believe it really, really helps to, to that I went through all the stages myself, that I did the groundwork myself, that I set in user interviews, that I tried to create a vision, uh, for, um, a, a strong customer vision myself back in the days. Um, but sometimes it's also a bit challenging because on the one side, I think it's very helpful to be a CEO that has a product understanding because I believe we're a new type of leaders, right? I think the whole entire tech scene um, will change massively. I think the whole world will change massively um, through technology and I think understanding Understanding how to build those products, understanding how to um, create sustainable businesses, to think them from a user's perspective is quite helpful. Um, however, I still believe like leading a company, like a CPO and a CEO role, in my case, it's a different role. And I think it's also very natural that these people fight with each other <laughs> to a certain degree because it will make us better and it uh, helps us to challenge each other. I mean, since I have the privilege to work with both of you, I can say that I think what stands out is your passion for your product. And um, this is what I observe in product-led companies. Um, CEOs and leadership teams have a passion for their product. Um, not for the business um, in the first place, but in the first place for the product. And that, I think, um, distinguishes them. I, I'm not sure whether you need a product background to having this, but I think the passion for the product, is, uh, in my observation, is decisive. Yeah. I, well, you know, to follow on that, like, uh, you know, we went from you know four founders to three three hundred people globally today, and we are serving more than seven hundred customers out there. But it's still very early days for the company. Mm -hmm. Like we have to really be very very connected to the product, to the customers, and you you want to really like have passion to do that, and, and you yeah. know, want to want to understand them, want to you know do, do something new. It's not about like just like optimizing you know exactly. specific things. That may be something for you know a much later stage. But I think you know we can see that you can scale these kinds of companies very far to, today. I think also what makes a big difference, uh, when I speak to my company Monday morning, I'm, we're not just presenting the business numbers, we're also presenting customer voices. So our user researcher yeah. would actually show little snippets from customer videos, just that everyone in the company listens to how our customers speak about the product, what do they actually say, um, because I think this creates the empathy and I think maybe it helps to be a product-led CEO here uh, to come up with those things because it's so, the business side is important, but the customer side is equally important, I believe. Yes, of course. I mean, I just telling you, whenever Oscar is talking about Ivan, um, he always says, does it make the life of a developer better and easier? That's mm -hmm. What, this is your North Star, whenever you're discussing business. And I think this is a good example for product-led growth, yeah? Does it matter for the developer? Yeah, we had an interesting discussion about that at our <laughs> board meeting, on, you know, yeah. two days ago. So, was, you know, something that definitely is, uh, you know, guiding us. And you know, from early days, when we were trying to figure out things, we were just, you know, building things for ourselves, and we were trying to figure out like, how can we, you know, how can we, you know, uh, make, you know, grow faster? What are the things there that, you know, we could could change in the way we operate? And and you know, we spent lots of time and lots of energy, lots of money trying to, you know, build up structures that. That we didn't fully understand, but you know, we went on, on, and you know, continued growing with the product, and you know, made our first 10 million in revenue by, by just you know, making the product available for the people who you know, want to you know, be our, our users and customers, and, and that's been a that's been a you know, great great journey for us. So, absolutely. Um, can I ask you what strategic advice would you give to other entrepreneurs, maybe a little behind with respect to the maturity of their ambition and and uh, um, yeah, projects. Uh, what would you, uh, what advice would you give them in order to create uh, product-led growth for their companies? I think. Um Really focus, first of all, focus on the main problem that you're trying to solve and don't get overexcited by technology. One of the advices uh, my, my former boss on my very first job gave me, it was back in the days, in the early days of mobile, I said, you know what, don't forget that technology is an enabler, not a driver. So really focus on the problem and then think how you can solve it. And I think the second part is find a very simple framework um, based on that, you drive strategy and your organization. And for us, this is uh, like this is active user growth, and this is the main product. And it can be as simple as that. Uh, and based on that, make decision and make a strict prioritization. <clears throat> because if you don't focus in the early days of a startup, you get lost. 
you get too distracted by too many things and in the end it's about building your product and make sure that you can onboard new users. Yeah. So for early stage companies, I think you know strategic advice is a, it's a big word. Like you know what they should be fo fo really focused on is achieving product market fit, and that's I think more important than anything else that you can do at an at an early stage. And product market fit is is uh, it's interesting, right? Uh, some people take product market fit to mean that you know you have to have a, like a super rare product, but the market bit is actually the more important one. You have to find a great market and build something that can satisfy that market. And when you have product market fit, you will know because the you know, customers, the people are going to be demanding more and more from you. So stay focused on, on you know, you know, finding that product market fit, building what resonates with the audience and really you know, always focus on that. Figure out what are the best metrics to track you know, if you are achieving that or not. You know, you mentioned like you know user user uh, voices and, and you know hearing what what the customers are saying. What we did at Ivan was you know we set set up this uh, automated daily email that was sent to all of our staff, all of our investors early, early on that that just listed like how many people are using the product, what's our current recurring revenue, something that automatically goes out to the entire team, keeps everybody really connected to how the business is doing, how our product is being adopted, and you know sometimes we had you know. Many times we had difficult times. Then we overcame some challenges and you know we won over some some you know customer that was a bit skeptical about us. And that would show immediately in the numbers, you know, that were automatically sent over to the team the following day. And that keeps people pretty motivated. That brings us back to the. Oh, sorry. Priscilla. Yeah, I also wanted to add like we always talk so much like figure out what 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 kind of problem you solve for your customers, but also try to figure out why are people using your product? Because it's often not what you want them to do, so to say. Uh, it's actually often a complete different reason than what you built for. And that's also, it's a very interesting insight. And I think this is what you need to know because then you can encourage your people to also refer to their friends and to even like grow further. Mm -hmm. But you need to be very aware why your people even come. And I tell you, in 90% of the cases, it's not the reason why you think they actually come, but it's a completely different one. Very good point, very good point. Like, we launched Ivan with a database as a service, and in the early days we thought we were a database company. And <laughs> that didn't really work out when we then went out to, for example, hire database salespeople. Well, we're, we're a developer tools company. We, make, we do make databases available for people, but what we help them do is actually like, get very easy access to them so they can do something else and not have to care about databases. And there's a fine distinction between these two fields that took us a long time to figure out and you know we were still trying to figure it out and you know trying to figure out who are the new class of users and what what jobs are we solve, you know doing for them that's i think the important bit that yeah. brings me a little bit back to the initial question um, um product design versus sales so can it be said that um product led companies uh, the products are bought not sold what do you think christina <laughs> Yeah, I think um, if you change the perspective, they're bought, not sold, you actually put the customer in the middle and not the business. And I think this is, uh, that's very helpful. Um, also in terms of, again, organizational structure, I think it just helps a lot to change the thinking. In our growth department, our growth department is basically the marketing slash sales department. We now also squatify it, um, this part. So we don't think, again, in performance marketing and brand marketing and like life cycle marketing. We completely change that. We think in terms of consideration, awareness, acquisition. So we really put, again, the customer in the foreground when we do marketing and sales because a customer considers you or a customer creates, like, is aware now that you exist as a company and you probably need different people. You need a brand marketer, you need a designer, you need a performance marketer to, to, to actually get to this stage. So I think, again, if you wanna, um, want your product to be bought, you need to rethink how, how you structure your organization because it can help to, to rethink and put mm -hmm. a different perspective on it. Yeah, that makes sense. Like, the way I look at it at Ivan is that you know, what we're doing, like, we're solving developers, you know, Problems. We're helping them, them, you know, do more and focus more on their own applications. So they have to be the ones who, like, want to have this platform. But there definitely is a role for sales. Sales comes in, you know, to help these customers, the bigger ones especially, to kind of navigate the space and build, you know, confidence in like this, you know, this platform that we're providing to, to you know, the, uh, the the customer. It's not about just like solving one one, you know 
particle or small small piece of the, the puzzle, it's something that you know gives them you know the customer confidence that hey we can you know go far with this team, and that's where our our sales has had you know a big impact on on the company. Uh, real, it's really connected with kind of you know customer success, account management, more so than than you know just going out and, and you know selling to audiences who never heard of us before. And I also believe you need to really surround yourself by the target group. So we're now building financial products for the masses and like constantly, like pretty much every week, I talk to people um, just in my private life that are struggling with financial investments. And I think by constantly soaking up this information, what are the problems, uh, why do people not get started, for example, I think that's also very important to get the different nuances um, because you can only sell a product in the end if you really understand what their problem is and what are the words that somehow trigger them. And uh, in the end, um, wh what are even things that people would find interesting or where they feel like this is more trustworthy than the products that are out there, especially in like fintech products. Coming back to the advice piece um, to, to other entrepreneurs, what kind of talent you think uh, one should recruit in an early stage of a company in order to create product-led growth like you were able to create it? Um, what is the, how does a good product-led growth company team look like? I usually give them a challenge that we currently have in the company and I see how they solve it. And if someone comes and I see this person has not taken the time to actually speak to at least three of their friends, uh, go a little bit into market research, try to research problems, um, it's a no-go for me because we really need people that understand to create empathy with their customers and in the end, like get also on top of that data um, to actually make a point. And for me, this is a mix of qualitative and quantitative research that at least should happen in this case. And if this is not the case, um, they m might not be the right people for us. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I think that makes makes a lot of sense when you're thinking of like how you're building the product. But, like, I think one one piece of advice for early stage companies is really to think of like, so. You're looking to scale the company to be able to serve more customers. So what are also some of the less obvious roles that you have to fill in the company to be able to do so? So I think a lot of companies set up their you know, people or HR organizations way too late when they already have run into a bunch of problems. So I think you know, focusing there early on or at least you know, ma making sure that it's, you know, you're thinking about it when you're building the company and building the organization and trying to figure out like, what kind of a culture you want to have in the company. Mm -hmm. You need to invest in people because it all starts from people, and then you know you get to also like filling all the less, uh, the more obvious roles. Like you know you, you need more product managers for sure to be able to build you know product led success. You need all the engineers. You need the salespeople. But what should the organization look like? That's an important question that, that a lot of the people just uh, kind of run into when they are, are facing a you know bunch of scalability issues. Yeah, also we grew quite massively this year. Um, so last, at the beginning of the year, we were 50 people. Now we're always 200. And what was important for us as well to establish a strong middle management layer before uh, that actually brings that mindset. It has worked in companies before that act that way because if your middle managers, at some point you cannot be involved as a C-level anymore. So you need to have people that are advocates and they're basically the ambassadors of this kind of thinking to bring it further into the organization. I think that's also really key to get strong middle managers that are bringing the message uh, to the people in the end. Very nice to hear. People make the difference, yeah. like always. <laughs> um, maybe as a final question, what have been the biggest challenges um, if you look back in, 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 the, in your company's growth? Um, I think it's a very obvious on finding the right talent <laughs> because we all know everyone is looking for the best tech talent. So that's the biggest challenge for us as a company. And um, for us very personally is as well, building financial products is not the same as building a filter function in an e-commerce app because <laughs> you actually, um, as agile as you want to be, there's a certain part of it which requires a waterfall um, because you need to get it through the regulator. And I think that's um, um, on the one side great that we do have regulation, but on the other side, um, the processes, how you act as a tech company and a customer-centric tech company uh, versus getting something through the regulator sometimes uh, it's not it's not going very hand in hand so to say yeah i think it's you know it, it all comes back to the people like finding the right people for the company and finding the right people for this company at this particular stage like you can look at you know all the success that other people or other companies have had out there and you know you can look at the talent that that's there some of those might, might be a good fit for you 
but attracting some of this talent you know that's already done everything you want to do is is hard like they've already done it like why would they want to do it again and you know would they actually be a good fit for your organization at your current stage so finding the people who are passionate about what you want to you know build next and who are a great fit for for this stage that's i think the, the biggest challenge and it kind of gets you to the next challenge which is like taking those people with you on the journey as the company grows yeah. the company that you know you founded is different from the company when you're 20 people when you're 100 people when you're 300 people so you know helping people make the journey with you that's that's the big challenge yeah and i mean in fast growing company you always have to do this forward hiring right you um, you have to hire now um, in, a, in an infrastructure which is actually too small and too little for the for the heavy weights you want to attract Uh, because you have to look forward 12, 24 months. So um, that makes life sometimes difficult, I know. And you've been great in overcoming that challenge. I think time is over, unfortunately, and we can go on and go on, I know. Thank you very much for coming. Um, uh, please um, join me in applauding our two CEOs. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> for sharing their views. And I think, um, I don't know what the next... Um, program this, uh, but I think we are done and enjoy slash for the day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.